This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Co, a mechanical engineer and the primary author of Zero to Monero, and Sarang Norther of the Monero Research Lab about the release of the second edition of Zero to Monero, a technical guide to a private digital currency for beginners, amateurs, and experts. Monero Talk starts now. All right, guys. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having us. So, the Rang and uh, Ko. Is it, is it Ko? Is that what yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, Ko, I never met you. Have you ever been out in the public yet in terms no. of... Uh, thanks? No, never. First okay. time. So, I guess uh, that, that's a good first question. What was everybody's role in the Zero to Monero? I was... Uh, I was the main, yeah, I, I wrote most of it, and Sarang had some input as well. I only occasionally jumped in to, like, give a thumbs up, basically. <laughs> okay. And offer and, a few updates based on, like, bulletproofs and things like that that I worked on. And this all derived from Kurt's original paper? What, what's, like, the, what was Kurt's involvement? That's right. So, way back... Um, if, if you'll remember, at the end of 2017, uh, cryptos were going like this. And so I got interested and was looking into Monero, and then I wanted to understand how it worked. But it was like, the, most of the stuff you find out there is very non-technical. So you'll see something like ring signatures, You reference old transactions or old outputs. Well, what does that actually mean? So I I was lucky enough to find Kurt's paper, and then while I was reading it, I decided to um, like as as part of my learning process, I I took notes on his paper and also did some edits, and then in that way, that's kind of how how it got started. It's just me taking notes on his old his original paper, and then okay. and then I just decided to like to go all the way and release it as an update, like an update almost on what he had originally produced. Very cool. So you yeah. had contacted Sarang and and Kurt as well, and it told them you were going to try to. Well, so, like it was kind of like that. This was this was the for the first edition early in early 2018. I was just going through the paper, and then while I was doing that, of course, I went to the MRL IRC channel, which is where you can talk to people who know about Monero, obviously. Right. So that's kind of how I got con- got in contact with them originally. That was that was two years ago, though. Wow. Time flies in crypto land. Yes. So, w- what is your background in? Me, um, mechanical engineering. So, not not that relevant exactly. It's just, I guess, the the mindset of an engineer is helpful, but otherwise, I had to learn everything from scratch, which is why I ended up taking a lot of notes on Kurt's original paper because Kurt is um, more of a computer background or computer science background, I think, and also mathematical background. So. I had to learn a lot of, like, it, 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 it feels simple now to me, but like um, modular arithmetic and then simple, crypto- simple, simple elliptic curve cryptography was very difficult to wrap my head around at the very beginning. So a lot of the things that I added to Kurt's original paper were very simple, like, concepts about how to understand elliptic curve cryptography yeah 
I, I, I can't remember where we started with that. <laughs> no, no, no. That, that was a perfect answer. So what would you say are some of the kind of the, the insights you had along the way as you were learning this, literally going from zero to Monero? Um, right. Kind of learning cryptography as you, you went along. What was kind of like your big aha moments? Really? Oh, I get it now. I don't know if I had an aha moments so much as it's kind of an accum accumulation of understanding. So you have to start with what is the modulus operation, right? And then how do you apply it to each different kind of arithmetic operation? And then how does, how does that allow you to understand how a simple crypt or elliptic curve operation is, is computed? So if you, if you want to add two curve points together, that's like the simplest operation. But to do that is this complicated equation that involves modular arithmetic. So how do you, how do you comprehend this simple equation to do a simple operation? So it's kind of, you have to build up little by little to really understand in the end, like the, at the end you understand um, ring signatures, but to get there is just a lot of tiny little steps. So I think the, the real takeaway is that to understand something, you have to you have to take all those steps in sequence and and carefully look at each 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 one to make sure you understand it. So I think that's like the the the, the learning process in general is just tiny steps and one on top of each, the next or the previous. Yeah, I, I by no means have begun to understand it on, on the level that you guys understand it. I um, was looking through this a for a few hours today just to, you know, come up with questions, but have yet to really sit down and try to understand it on a mathematical level, which I hope to intend to do uh, one day. Right. Um, <laughs> I, do I do have, you know, I'm an engineer as well. Um, okay, cool. This stuff, gets, this stuff gets pretty deep, pretty fast. Um, Serang, similar question, I guess. What, you know, so you've been looking at Monero for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, have a very high level viewpoint of it. You understand it deeply on a mathematical level. Has your viewpoint of it as a system changed throughout time and how you understand it? Do you see it differently today than what you saw it as originally? I mean, are you, is that evolving? Yeah, I mean, I think what Ko was saying about it being kind of levels and layers of abstraction is a really good way to look at it. You know, I mean, at, at one kind of like on, on one level, you can look at a construction like a ring signature or a proving system, um, and you don't necessarily need to understand how like the underlying mathematical structure works. You know, I mean, you don't necessarily need to understand how, you know, elliptic curve group arithmetic works in order to build these constructions. Like they're typically very, very general. And that's good because it means that like you can often kind of swap out underlying plumbing sometimes and the guarantees that you get for security are going to be exactly the same. Um, but if you're implementing something and you want to you know, work on efficiency and things, um, then, you know, you do need to understand how the underlying group arithmetic works for like the particular construction that you're building it on. Um, and so there's like these different levels and layers to it. And um, depending on what you want to understand and do with it, you know, you can, you can kind of try to hit it at those different levels. And I mean, ideally, we'd all understand it at all the levels, but, you know, it really depends on what you want to do with it. So I would say, like, my, what I've appreciated about it going forward is the fact that, like, the protocols evolve so much over time. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to say that, like, Monero uses the crypto note construction, kind of protocol construction, um, but that's, like, strictly not necessarily true anymore. You know, it's, it was highly influenced still by the crypto note construction, which, talked about a way to combine ring signatures and one-time signature or one-time addresses together, um, but it's evolved over time. Um, and I think understanding kind of where it came from and how it's improved over time and what's been added to it has been something that like no one's really wanted to document up until now. Um, and so having the initial work that Kurt did and then like this huge undertaking for two different iterations of Zero to Monero that Co did was fantastic because I mean, it's I would say it's basically the closest thing that Monero has to a protocol specification. Um, I mean, it's, it's not really a full protocol specification in like the ideal way we'd like to have it, but 
it's definitely the closest thing we have to saying, you know, what does the protocol do now and how does it work? Um, and having that kind of laid out is really nice. So, um, so I, I think that to add, to add on to that and, and also Doug's original question, which was um, like epiphanies, I feel like once you, once you see how all of the, the pieces of Monero work um, and then see how they all fit together in the end, that there's a kind of elegance to the final, the final construction of a Monero transaction. Since all these little pieces, I mean, they're cool on their own. And then when you see how they fit so neatly together, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's pretty amazing, I think. And I think, also, useful, yeah. Yeah, I think it's also useful when looking at, you know, different ways to improve the protocol. Um, I mean, we've been looking at kind of, you know, so-called like next generation transaction protocols and instructions. Um, and some of them are, are kind of like neat plug and play solutions almost that are able to like take different levels of the transaction protocol I mean, kind of pull them out and, and, you know, put different plumbing in their place. And I think like, if anything, like an epiphany that I had going through it was, you know, looking at how you could kind of generalize some of the stuff that we're doing right now um, and be able to kind of rip it out and put new stuff in its place that could be more efficient. So, I mean, like, for example, looking at Triptych, which is one example of a so-called like next generation transaction protocol. Um, it has like certain mathematical properties in common with what, you know, existed before with, you know, the existing ML SAG ring signatures um, and this proposed CL SAG signatures. Like there's certain things in common with those that Triptych also shares. And I guess like once you're able to kind of generalize and understand that construction, then I guess you can kind of understand how you can like pull some of the building blocks out and replace them with something else to get new properties that you want. Um, and I guess that's kind of like an elegance that I've really enjoyed seeing in the protocol. And I think it's useful when looking at different ways to improve it going forward. Yeah, there's a, there's a level there's a level almost there's almost um, a reverse a reverse complexity once you go if you start from the bottom, which is all these little intricacies, and then they accumulate into the transaction protocol. And then above that even is a is a conceptual layer that that is more universal to all that, that encapsulates all kinds of transaction protocols. So that the the underlying plumbing, as Sering was saying, you can replace bits and pieces, and they all it still matches the over the overlying conceptual structure, which is what are the basic requirements of a transaction for for it to like qualify as a useful transaction. And so I, I, that gets back to the point in your original email to me, which was about. Um, the, the post I made on, on Reddit about what it means to be a, a cryptocurrency where it's cryptocurrencies are just collections of messages, which we apply rules to. And then these rules are enough to make, make the, all these messages that we've collected together act like a real currency that we can, we can use without any kind of concern for the underlying complexities. Yeah. Right. It's really so, just at its core, it's just a messaging system that we just are attributing value to. Is that that was kind of the joke, right? The, the gist of your, your post right. there? Right. Right. So, Frank, do you look at it that way as well? Um, yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it. It's a very general way to look at it, but it's a good way to look at it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's, I guess if you kind of like strip away enough layers, you know, basically it's just kind of an agreed upon way that different nodes and entities on the network, you know, look at what messages are considered, you know, uh, valid or acceptable as part of this like ongoing ledger or chain of messages. Um, and then at some point, like you have enough of a structure behind it that you can call that a transaction protocol. So what, what was different uh, in this version of Zero to Monero and the, and the previous one what, in, in general? Like what was added? What was kind of the, the bulk of what was added? Oh, okay, sure. Um, so there actually is quite a lot that was added. Uh, in terms of Monero proper, which is the basic 
Monero. Um, a lot of updates were made to Monero, like uh, bulletproofs were added since the first first edition went out. Um, so I replaced the 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 range proof. What the, the the discussion I had about range proofs, I had to replace that with bulletproofs. That's one small part, and then also some optimizations were made, which I re updated, and then all sorts of tiny little details were changed. So, for example, um, in the blockchain itself, the this this dynamic block weight system was added. Um, so I I went through, that 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 was like a big chunk of the blockchain chapter is now about how this dynam dynamic block weight works and how why or in, and let's in the the like a description of why the fees that we have make sense or how 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 this this minimum fee that we have how it's derived um yeah there's a lot of things here i i read that a little bit today and i, I was uh, i had arctic mind uh, voice in my head as i was right did, did you talk I, to him a lot I didn't. Well, I did. I did email him a bit, but he has he has some videos that I went through to try to tease out all the little intricacies that went into it. So yeah, I his, I basically I didn't really copy him, but copy what he had to say. But I he was the source for all what I wrote about that. And then of course I added a large a large section to the second edition, which is. They're all things that are like beyond the, the core protocol. So we have transla transaction related proofs that let you prove things about the transactions you've made. Like if you claim you made a transaction, you have, and then someone says, well, did you really? I don't believe you. Then you can make a proof about it. Say, yeah, I really, really did make this. And it's pretty undisputable because of this proof. And there's a bunch of different little proofs you can make. And um, ultimately, I, or, uh, we, well, I actually added a couple proofs that haven't been implemented yet, but which would be helpful to have implemented. And then organized uh, uh, an audit protocol that, can, that could theoretically be used to audit uh, someone's balance. So how much, how much Monero someone actually owns right now without revealing information about um, the Monero they might own or spend in the future, um, which we currently can't do that kind of audit because um, the, the typical way is you just give someone your private view key, but if someone has your private view key, then they'll learn about all the things you um, you might come to own in the future, the outputs you might come down in the future, which uh, isn't very um, not ideal, I guess. So and then, what, what is yeah. what is that approach? What is the new approach that you, you're proposing? This approach here, or this is something that's it's been just talked it's, about? Um, it's just a collection of output proofs you can or transaction proofs you can make. So it's just a you make this kind of proof, and then you also have all these other kind of proofs, and together they let an auditor be confident that the balance that they've analyzed is accurate for what you have right now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's more of a way of organizing the transaction transaction related proofs you can make um, to get a certain conclusion. So it's not actually, I don't. It's not that uh, crazy. I don't think. <laughs> I, I expect. I ex yeah. Go ahead. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I always just thought it was. You know, you give somebody your review key. Obviously, yeah. There, I guess there's a lot of issues there, right? So this is a way to kind of do that even in a more private way. So you're right. just getting off at that single moment in time. Yeah. Sorry, where did you, were you going to comment, I guess? But again. Oh, no. I mean, like it's, it's just, I think it's a more flexible way to look at, um, to look at the auditing kind of principles. Um, I mean, like the original conception of the idea behind an audit was, um, they, they kind of call it like the club treasurer model where, you know, suppose that you are the treasurer for um, like a club that you're a part of um, and you want to be able to provide, you know, information about, you know, current and future transactions using like the club's finances to the other members. 
Um, and the private view key does some of that and, you know, showing other things about particular future spends involving key images is another way to do that. Um, but it's like a very all encompassing view of, of, of what you're doing. Um, and in some cases you might want that transparency, but like Co was saying in other circumstances, you might not, maybe you just want to provide kind of a, a point in time view of your balance, um, and be able to, you know, kind of restrict what happens going forward. And in that case, like you need some additional, you need to do some additional work in order to do that, um, in a way that kind of preserves privacy as much as possible without revealing any information in the future. So the idea of having kind of a more all encompassing comprehensive audit protocol helps to give that flexibility where you don't want like the full like club treasurer model, um, but maybe you just want to be able to provide some information to an auditor for other purposes. Um, yeah, well, Often when you're audited, sometimes you have to show that you own not necessarily exactly the S, uh, give out the exact amount you own, but that you're in between a certain threshold of whatever it may be. Is that something that can be done or was talked about here? That's actually something you can do right now. It's called a reserve proof, I think. I think that, that one is the reserve proof. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, if I remember correctly, the reserve proof uh, requires providing your key images I think I mm -hmm. can't remember exactly. Yeah, I think so, it does. So that, that does reveal information about like what, yeah, it's, it's a question of like, are you interested in revealing the amounts in addition to where those, like where those amounts actually live versus just saying you have the amounts, but I'm not going to tell you where they are. Right. Oh, right. Okay. I remember. So with a reserve proof, it, um, you provide, you, you first prove you own certain outputs and then you also provide the key image for those outputs, which, since those key images don't appear on the blockchain, then those outputs you own are unspent. So you must own this amount of Monero unspent. It hasn't been spent. But by providing those key images, when you spend those outputs, then the person who has the reserve proof will know you have spent them. So that's kind of a privacy leak. It, it reveals in the future when you spend spend those owned outputs, right? So one innovation, or I, I, I don't know, innovation, new proof that I, that I came up with was the unspent proof, which just, it proves an, an output is unspent without also providing the key image. So someone with an unspent proof knows it hasn't been spent yet, but doesn't know when in the future it does get spent. Yes. So that's part of the audit pro audit protocol is this new kind of proof. You know, you have a, a you know, whatever it is, a hundred Monero, but the, somebody's just asking if you have between zero and a thousand Monero, is there a way to confirm that you own that without revealing that you have a hundred Monero? Because this is kind of something that's often asked in audits, right? So like you have between, you know, zero and, a million dollars worth of Monero or a million and ten million dollars worth is there I, or... yeah you can I think that's I mean you, you you can you can prove you have a minimum amount of money by showing the money that you own and then hypothetically you might have more money beyond that that they don't know about right I guess, I you guess. Can want that you yeah. don't have that threshold Right, because that's. I mean, like you'd probably play around with additional range proofs, I suppose. I don't think it was really constructed with the idea of like specific ranges in mind, but I guess you can envision kind of extending that idea using commitments and range proofs too. I don't know if you could prove you have less than a certain amount without showing all the money you own. I don't know if that's possible. That's yeah, I don't think we haven't really looked at that yet. It, it, maybe it's worth looking. To. <laughs> I'm not. Off the top of my head, I don't know if that's possible. Anyway, yeah. There's more. There's other things in there, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. We're, we're, we're getting stuck on this one here. <laughs> so, um, so mention like um, CL SAGs um, and Triptych. Are those discussed in here? As Or those aren't even... Uh, I did. I added this section for CL SAGs since I expect that it will be implemented before the third edition comes out, if it ever does come out. So it might as well be in there so that people who want to learn about it can learn about it, especially since it's, it's, it's like near term when it's going to appear. But Triptych, no, I haven't looked into that at all. It's kind of uh, in development still, so all the details are up in the air almost, or in some sense. 
the rank, do you want to give any update on that as to whether or not the likelihood of those things getting implemented and um, so, so there, there's kind of an informal audit work group um, that's looking into, you know, kind of the logistics of getting both the math and the particular implementation for CL SAG audited. Um, I mean, so far we've had like some other additional kind of informal external reviews that have looked pretty positive so far. Um, but you know, barring any kind of unseen circumstances, I think it's pretty likely that in whenever the next network upgrade happens, that CL SAG will be a part of that. Um, that'll reduce the size and verification time of, um, of signatures quite a bit. It's pretty nice. Uh -huh. I mean, as far as other kind of next generation, so-called like sublinear transaction protocols go, um, Triptych's one example. Uh, we have some other ones that we're looking into. Um, there is kind of some initial test code um, for an implementation of Triptych, but you know, that has also not undergone external peer review. And there's some additional engineering challenges involved with that that we're still working on. Uh, no, uh, even in the opening paragraphs of Zero to Monero talks, I think even the first line you have, for currency to exist digitally and, and be widely adopted, its users must believe its supply is strictly limited. And you basically go on further describing that. That's kind of been one of the biggest criticisms of Monero, right? People criticizing the fact that it's um, uh, not as easily audited as something like Bitcoin, which is completely transparent. So you could you know, clearly see all, you know, all the transaction amounts. Um, what's what's your opinion on that? This is obviously a topic that always comes up. I know. think I think you could make the the same objection to gold. So back in the day, uh, before like modern science, there were all these people called alchemists who imagined they could create gold out of lead, right? And no one. Back then, science wasn't advanced enough to know to realize that alchemy is very difficult um, and expensive. So it could have been the case that someone, some alchemist somewhere, was pumping out gold like from their machine, uh, but no one could know for sure that some that alchemist wasn't doing that. So in some sense, historically, gold has always or has has often been the supply has been very much unknown to everyone. All you know is about the, the limited amount of gold that you're aware of. And then some you could like hypothesize about like local kingdoms how much gold is circulating. But globally and in the hands of alchemists, you never really knew how much gold was out there. And yet gold still was very reliably used as money. So I think um I think a similar, you can you could take a similar look at the narrow. So, unless inflation becomes obvious, then people are willing to use it. Like if the, if an alchemist had inflated with, with crazy abandon, then gold would have fallen by the wayside. But since it didn't, then people were fairly confident that it was like the the supply was stable more or less. And I think a similar you could you could take a similar attitude towards Monero. If it doesn't inflate like crazy, then you can more or less assume that it's doing fine. And then to actually become confident that it's fine, you investigate the underlying reality of it. So in the in, in the case of gold, you um, understand how elements work and realize that Creating elements out of other elements is very, very difficult. So in that in that way, you can be sure. And also you can learn about geography and understand that there's not much gold to, to easily extract. So, And then if you go to Monero, you look into the how it works, the, mechanical, the mechanics of it, and um, the code, and check for yourself that the code works the way you want. So... And then that way you get an understanding of the fact that the supply is limited. So I think the analogy is kind of yeah, kind of works. It's an interesting way of looking at it. I'm sure there's some flaws in that analogy. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess. So what do you see as being the biggest risk? Do you see it as being uh, the math is potentially flawed, or the code is potentially flawed, or the implementation is potentially flawed? If you had to assess like a, a high 
you know, put those in order of risk, where would you see the potential flaw being most likely? Can you say those again? Sorry. Well, okay. you know, the, the idea is that there, there might be a flaw, right? A flaw right. in the underlying math or yeah. a flaw in the, in the protocol itself or a flaw in the way the protocol was implemented. Um, Implementation you, is definitely the biggest risk. Because that's, I guess it's the it's it's one of the more difficult ones to investigate. Right. Is there anything that that we can further do as a community to help kind of ensure that Monero was properly implemented? Is there, or is, mm -hmm. is that just a matter of time and people looking at it? Uh, well, first of all, it's important for more people to understand how it actually works and how it's supposed to work. And then beyond that, seeing if it does work that way. That's, yeah, right. that's really it, <laughs> honestly. Uh, I know I, I think, know it's kind of an old topic at this right. point, but it's... I think it's a, that's the classic response, is you just have to go and look yourself. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I, think, something that's, I think it's something that's improved over time, too. I mean, I definitely agree. Like, implementation risks are by far probably the largest ones in, in practice that could occur. Um, but, you know, things like getting important parts of the code externally reviewed professionally is like one way to mitigate that. It doesn't eliminate the risk, but it mitigates it. Um, and, you know, doing a lot better formal analysis of the underlying math, you know, from using like well understood principles and methods of proof is another way to kind of mitigate that risk. It doesn't remove it entirely, right? There's still flawed proofs that ends up being done. Um, but I think just kind of making each of these layers you know, better over time in ways that we know how is like an easy, I mean, not easy, but <laughs> I would say like a well understood way to improve the security and mitigate the possibility of risks at those different layers. Yeah. So do, do you uh, anticipate there being more um, basically auditing taking place of, of the code? Uh, me? I don't no, just, I'm just asking you guys both. So, like, you know, obviously, you know, like, uh, Bulletproofs was audited, and as we're implementing new things, mm -hmm. you know, we're doing audits. Um, well, pe people sometimes ask, right, like, well, why don't you just go and get the entire code base audited? And I was like, that'd be, that, like that'd be fantastic. Um, it's enormous. You know, to a certain extent, like, it's, it's parts of it have been inherited um, and been added on to in different ways by different people, uh, and it's constantly evolving. You know, and in the absence of a complete formalized protocol spec that would be extremely difficult to do. It would take an exceptionally long time and it would be unreasonably expensive. And by the time it's done, you will have probably changed the protocol and the implementation a great deal just because it evolves so quickly. Okay. So I think it's important to kind of understand where you're most likely to encounter larger risk. Um, and things like range proofs are an area in the code where you're likely to encounter larger risk. And things like signature verification are an area where you're likely to encounter larger risk. So I think in general, you want to tend to prioritize and modularize those as much as possible. And that's what we've tried to do. You know, CL SAG, for example, is a fairly modular way to replace ML SAGs. And that means that kind of the marginal risk in replacing it is pretty limited. And so we can kind of like compartmentalize and audit that part. And range proofs are very similar. You can kind of compartmentalize and audit those. Um, and so I think like the more that we can do that going forward, um, the better we can prioritize audits that are reasonable to do. Um, because, like, frankly, the entire code base as a whole is probably never going to be completely audited formally. Like, that'd be great, but it's probably not going to happen. So if we can kind of prioritize it better, I think that that's a way to, you know, like, be judicious and reasonable with mitigating risk. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you can always um, focus down on the highest risk parts of the code. So anything that, that touches the... Uh, your private keys are the highest risk parts of the code. And those aren't necessarily very many functions throughout the code base compared to all the functions. It's a small fraction that actually interact with the very sensitive information. So I think if you, if you want to go and look and make sure the code is doing what it's supposed to, then um, focus on the highest risk stuff like Sign, if, if it's if it's being used to sign something, is that implemented properly? And that also goes for new implementations of Monero, which are probably 
of highest risk for users since it's doubtless going they would doubtless have far fewer eyes on them different implementations i mean so in the future those might appear i don't know if they will or not but it's reasonable to assume they might so code do you do you think i, I like your analogy with you know the alchemy and the gold do you but do you think bitcoin is is arguably more sound than monero uh given all these things we're talking about right now yeah, I, don't, that, that, I don't necessarily see how it would be <laughs> i mean sound money more sound or more the fact that it's potentially i guess e easier to 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 audit maybe in one like in a small sense yes I mean, you can you can go and look directly on chain to see if all the amounts recorded add up to what you expect. But I guess what you're sacrificing there is just the whole fungibility aspect. You're, you're, you're I think I think it's um, it's just a conceptual like uh, it's not a matter of kind. It's not a difference of kind. It's just a difference of magnitude between auditing Monero and Bitcoin because it's just like a conceptual gap between them. So you have to you have to have some mental capability to to see that all the amounts in Bitcoin add up together. Like you need, you need to know how to add numbers, right? And then in, in Monero, it's just a much more complicated concept to see how um, commitments work and that they they all fit together so that the the amounts balance. But either either way, it's just a concept difference mm. to whether or not. Like, I guess that's my take on it. And, well, it we, and and I mean, we did have a blog post specifically on supply audit. And just I mean, just to be clear, like we use the word audit in a few different ways. So there's the idea of like auditing code that is to like check to see that it does what you expect. And there's the idea of like supply auditing, which to a lot of people means, can I go and just ensure that no additional um, currency on this chain has been mined or otherwise produced in transactions than was expected? And they are like different things. And we've recently released a blog post. I talked a little bit about some of the risks involved in the supply audit. Um, and just to be clear, like Bitcoin has not been immune to things like inflation bugs. So they have happened. Um, you know, as, as far as we know, you know, they haven't been exploited in a way that ended up being dangerous to anybody. Um, but I think all you really get with transparent amounts um, is that in theory, if you're looking carefully, you can assure yourself that no, um, you know, that no, that I mean that supply inflation, if it did happen, did in fact happen in a particular way. But what you do in response to that, you know, could still end up screwing people over. So, I mean, suppose that there was an implementation flaw that allowed for supply inflation, you know, perhaps you choose to like roll back the chain to a certain point. Well, in that case, you're going to screw people over and you just have to hope that you weren't caught up in that. I mean, it is true that in things like Monero and Zcash, you know, it is possible that there could be forms of inflation under certain particular circumstances that would not necessarily be detectable. Um, so there's like, there's different kinds of classes of risk involved with that. But as we said before, like there's risk in using a transparent chain as well. So um, I, I don't think it's quite as simple as saying that if you can count the amounts that appear on the chain, that you're guaranteed to be safe in all particular circumstances and and threat models. I think that's a little bit that's a little bit too naive for my taste. Um, but it is true that there are different risk profiles. Yeah, that was a great post, and I would encourage. We'll put that in the show notes. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't say it's like a complete look at all the nuances of supply auditing, but like we tried to we tried really hard to kind of really differentiate you know, the different kinds of risks, because I think they're more subtle than some people necessarily think about all the time. Right. And then look at it in light of it being this, uh, this, a design decision that was kind of made where you're sacrificing, potentially sacrificing a little of this to get a little of that. Mm -hmm. um, back to uh, uh, the details of Zero to Monero. I guess a good first question. Uh, what, what, is, what are elliptic curves? And uh, if you, if you want to explain those a little bit too. Oh my God. <laughs> And why, like, why are these even a part of what we're talking about? What is an, why is this all based on elliptic curves? What, what uh, role are they playing here? Okay, um, let's see. How should we begin? So, they serve in 
cryptocurrency or Monero. Right. So I guess um, elliptic curves have certain properties that are useful, which is why we use them. So, God, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, think, I think it's useful to say that they are not required for the kinds of cryptography that we do. So in general, like the higher level cryptographic constructions involving like public and private keys and signatures and ring signatures and commitments, like they don't inherently require elliptic curves. They like require particular mathematical group structures where certain kinds of operations are either very easy or very hard. So for example, being able to go from a private key to a public key is an operation that you want to be easy, but going from a public key back to a private key is an operation that you want to be very hard. And that's like the so-called discrete logarithm problem. And there's different like kinds of mathematical objects that you can use for which you have like these useful properties of being very easy or very hard in terms of properties. Um, and elliptic curves happen to form like this interesting group structure um, that ends up being efficient for our purposes, does not require any particular trust you know, um, like some other groups involving like RSA things um, require, um, but also end up being like very, very convenient for our purposes. So, um, I mean, like it's, some people like to draw out kind of pictures for what certain kinds of elliptic groups might look like, but those are kind of simplifications that are, you know, I, it's, it's, it's really hard to explain very neatly why elliptic curves give you the properties that you want uh, without kind of budging a little bit. Um, but they have these kind of like neat geographic kind of geometric properties if you look them up that show how you can like combine points together. Um, and that kind of combining points together can be done using like particular kind of like line operations. Um, and those end up kind of giving you this like group structure that you want. So you don't need elliptic curves, but we really like them. Yeah, I think one uh, well there's there's a, there's different different things that are they're used for, but one of the most crucial things in Monero is um, being able to prove you own something without also giving someone else the ability to make that same proof. So you can you can assign assign ownership of an output to someone's public key, and then the corresponding private key, which which was used to create the public key. You use that private key to sign a message. So you sign it. So you sign a message with your private key that says, "I this is my public key, and therefore I own this output." And that signature, no one else can no no one else can forge that signature. So elliptic curves let you let you do this, which is very nice. So that's not a that's not an explanation of what they are but rather what they can do. They, they are, they're, they're an example of a mathematical construction that can do something like that, but they're not the only one. Right. Um, right. The, point is, the point is that we want one that is both, um, that we can trust. That is like, you don't want there to be backdoors that make the so-called hard operations easy. Um, and building mathematical constructions that like give you that assertion is challenging to do. Um, but there we have a lot of really good, efficient mathematical constructions in certain elliptic curves that let you do that um, in a way that like we don't really have to necessarily question whether or not they were constructed honestly. Why, why does Monero use the elliptic curve it uses and not the same one as Bitcoin? And is there, what, what, the, what are the differences between the two? Are there advantages to one versus the other? Yeah, so the, for example, like the curve that Monero uses, um, it, it does, I'm going to try really hard not to like go in the weeds unnecessarily, but the curve that Monero uses um, has certain properties to its group structure that if you're not careful can get you into trouble. So there was like the so-called key image problem that arose a while back um, because certain things about the points on this curve weren't being checked in the way that they should have been. And had that been exploited, which we could verify like for sure it was not to be very clear, um, then someone could have effectively like double and triple and quadruple spent funds. So we know that this was not the case and these checks have been implemented. Um, using certain other elliptic curves with different properties, you don't run into this problem um, because you, you, you don't have like points that could be considered bad on those curves like you have on ours. So it means you have to be a little bit careful when you're doing operations. 
Um, the one that we use ends, ends up being quite efficient. Um, and the way that it was constructed um, basically leaves no room for question that it was constructed in a way that does not, as far as anyone knows, have any particular backdoors that would let you like brute force private keys in a, an easier way, for example. Yeah, it's, I think the, the bottom line is that it's just uh, an efficient curve to, to use for this kind of um, application compared to other curves. And a trusted one, like you were saying, right? Yeah, there's, there's, there, there's this really kind of interesting class of study of elliptic curves that says, you know, to what extent should you question whether or not there could be a backdoor and how the curve was designed? Like you can design new elliptic curves. Like it's, I wouldn't say this happens regularly, but it doesn't happen irregularly. Um, and the question is like, if you, if someone just hands you an elliptic curve and says, here, build something out of this, you know, how do you know that they didn't build it in such a way that maybe they can reverse engineer some of these operations? And there's like, there's ways to assure people that you did it in a way that is reasonable and where you don't have to question whether or not they did it right. And the one that we use is is pretty squeaky clean. And it's called it's called fully rigid. Yes, the term is fully rigid, which means that you can explain very very thoroughly why you made the design decisions that you made. And some curves like are not rigid, where like there's there's questions where everyone's like, well, here's the curve, and they're all like, well, why did you build it this way? They're like, I don't know, we just did. <laughs> it's like, well, that's not really an explanation. And obviously, Bitcoin's is fully rigid as well, right? I mean, that falls into that same category of trusted, very trusted elliptic curves, right? Or is there any? Uh... Um, there, so there, there are there are some questions about some of the constants involved with it. Um, it's it's stood the test of time pretty well, but you know we have modern curves like the one we use, where um, the idea of rigidity was well understood when it was designed. Um, and again, while you do you do have some small sacrifices where you have to you have to do certain checks on points um, in a way that if you don't do it, it can be a little bit dangerous. Um, but at the same time, like you get benefits from not having to trust that it was constructed, you know, without any backdoors in it. So it's it's always a bit of a trade off. Um, and to be fair, like there have been some some other kind of abstractions to the curve that have been done that let you kind of avoid some of these pitfalls. But you know, we, we don't necessarily get to adopt those very easily. Do we expect that one day Monero's elliptic curve may be updated and swapped out with something else? Is that something likely to happen eventually? That would be a source. Uh, whenever anyone suggests, like, why don't you rip out X and replace it with Y? Like, there may be benefits to that, but anytime you rip out large chunks of code and replace them with something new, like, you introduce the possibility of a lot of implementation errors. And I think, feel like that's an underappreciated risk. I haven't actually heard of any anything any um, any anyone commenting that there could be a curve better than the one that we use. I think I think over the past few years, the curve Monero uses uses has become more popular actually uh, in the encryption community. It has. And again, like that's not to say that there might not be better um, and more efficient implementations of that curve. So there's like the math behind the curve, and then there's like the code that actually does the math behind the curve. And you know, over time, like folks have found like more efficient ways to do the math for that same curve. Um, and that's something that you know is gets looked at from time to time. Um, but again, there's always still making sure that you've implemented it correctly and didn't introduce new risks while you're trying to make things better and faster. I think there's a pull request on the code base to implement something that's a little more efficient. That's the super cop, is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, there were some 64-bit operations. Um, it's, it's very non-trivial to implement those, and it's not like it's... Some things are fairly straightforward to rip out and replace. Like, that is not necessarily something that is trivial to rip out and replace. That kind of has its tentacles in a lot of different places. Um, but yeah, but that was from VTuner who worked on that. Yeah, I bought the, uh, the susceptibility to quantum computers and... Uh basically unraveling the discrete log. It, are, are some curves more um, immune to that than others, or are they all equally? I think there's I, I, I think there's a couple of curves maybe who are looking into that, but from what I understand, no, nothing really that rigorous out there. No, it's, it's one of those, like it's, it's very, very difficult to ascertain the likelihood um, that 
you know, in any particular timeline, a quantum computer will be able to um, like basically unravel the discrete logarithm problem to the complexity that we and the entire rest of the internet requires. Um, I mean, it is true that, you know, like it, it, it would imply that, um, you know, the, the chain could effectively be de-anonymized, you know, that's as far as I know the case for basically everyone out there um, and effectively like the entire internet as anyone knows it. So, you know, like, is it like a theoretical problem? You know, yes. Is it a theoretical problem for the entire world? Yes. <laughs> and, um, like, I, I would love to have like an efficient answer for it, but you know, I don't think anyone's really figured that out in, in a reliable way yet. There was a proposal just made today to uh, research it from Isthmus. Yeah. And I mean, it's something that we've thought about for, for a long time, but you know, in terms of saying like, here is a solution that is both reasonable, well-studied, efficient enough that folks would actually consider using it. And like, we don't have anything like that at this point. So I, I don't know, like it's, it's kind of nihilistic, but at some point, like it's, would Monero be screwed? Yes. Like would Bitcoin be screwed? Yes. Would like the entire world computing infrastructure be screwed? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. That's very nihilistic, but right. it's, it's, uh, what can you do about it? No. I, I almost wonder if um, if someone got too close to completing that kind of computer, if they would be like subject to assassinations or something. Oh, good lord! I don't know though. <laughs> Maybe that's a little out of bounds. <laughs> Let's not start those rumors. There's the chapter on ring signatures, and uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let's talk about Monero addresses. Sure. Uh, where you describe an address as the sum of the amounts contained in its unspent outputs. You want to talk balance about me? what's that? Its balance is yeah. Yeah, um, balance is a sum of amounts contained in its unspent outputs. So I, I think, think uh, yeah. It's sure. Here. Well, okay. Yeah. Um, so we have to think about what Monero like literally is. So it's, it's as, as we were talking about before, it's a collection of messages. And in each message, each, each, you can think of each message as saying, um, some person owns some amount of mon money. And so that person might have multiple messages saying, they own a certain amount of money. Uh, but on in the blockchain, there's only exists these messages. So how can we, how can we, so the, the amount of money you own is just the sum of amounts in all these messages. And the, the things you own are literally all the messages which list your name in it. So, I mean, not your name, but your address. We we substitute those because with your address, you use your address to prove that you own them, own those outputs when you, in the future, decide to spend them. So yeah, that's basically what we're dealing with. Right? How do you describe it similarly? I always like to think about it. I mean, everyone, everyone has the correct way to look at how addresses and outputs work, and of course, mine is the correct way. The like code for him is also the correct way. Uh, I, I always look at addresses as representing uh, spend authority. So as we all know, like your wallet address never directly appears on the chain. It's used to derive, you know, parts of these messages that, you know, can be directed to you. Um, and if you happen to control the secret data behind the address, um, that gives you the authority to sign those messages to transfer effectively those funds and new messages to other addresses. So I like to think of it in terms of spend authority. Which yeah, at least really helps to kind of uh, to differentiate between addresses and outputs. So addresses uh, never appear on chain, but knowledge of the private information lets you sign um, outputs to consume them and generate new outputs in messages. There's a, there's a sense in which each out each output has in fact an actual address that assigns ownership, and it just turns out that the the addresses we own privately can be used to spend multiple outputs which are listed to have different addresses. So the outputs on chain all have different addresses, and it turns out the way our addresses are constructed, 
we only need um, one one spend key to spend the multiple outputs which have different addresses listed on them, mm -hmm. which is very useful for privacy in terms of privacy and also efficiency. So instead of instead of always own, owning different outputs with di completely different addresses and then having to search the whole chain for one output that you, you own for your unique address, instead you can search it for a bunch of different ones that are all owned collectively by the same keys or spendable with the same private keys. Yeah, so, and it's a non-interactive process, which is really nice. So like a sender and a receiver don't have to kind of like negotiate what they want this one-time address to be because that would be very inefficient and require everyone to be online at the same time or have a side channel. How about um, ring confidential transactions? Cody, you want to kind of give your, your your description of that, your, your understanding of that. Sure. Let's see here. So, ring confidential, right, ring confidential transactions kind of meld a few different concepts together. So one of them is the, the ring signature, and then the other is the confidential part of transactions. So the fact that amounts are hidden so why are these combined? Why are these two things combined? It's because each output consists of an address and an amount, which is hidden behind the commitment. So a commitment, which represents an amount and an address, these two are tied together. So they always have to travel together. Um, so when you sign, when you prove that you own an output, it, it, it's also associated with the output amount that's being spent. But in the case of Monero, we use ring signatures, which means you take multiple outputs from the chain and then you're actually only going to spend one of them, but you say, I'm going to spend one of the outputs in this list of outputs. And then you, you make a ring out of, or you, you make a ring with all the, with this list of outputs and then you sign you make the ring si signature, and that proves that one of them is in fact owned by you, and then you're spending it. And then, but the amount, the, all, all those outputs have amounts connected to them. And you also want to prove that the amount you're spending is equal to all, all the amount that's being sent out of the transaction to new people, to new addre one time addresses. So, To get those amounts to balance, you you need the confidential part to be within. You need you need to prove that the amount that's being spent equals the amount that's being sent, right? So, I guess the simplest that's the simplest way I can say it. So that that proof is also part of the ring signature, since it's paired up with the. Um, the address signature, so the, the the proof that you own it is paired up with the proof that it balances the output, and by pairing them up this way, you you um you you prevent the you ensure that the amount being how can I say this uh, you don't want my God, let me see. I know I wrote this down in this chapter. I'll look it up. This is good stuff, though. I mean, this is uh, you know something that I've struggled to understand for a while. Like right. Um, right. So the, the I, sentence I wrote to some extent, like it's, it's kind of like I would say, like it's kind of the the crux of how like modern Monero works. You know, by being able to like obscure the origin of the funds in the signature. And also ensure that the amounts balance. I mean, like the way that I would looked at it is like at its kind of fundamental mathematical level, you're able to kind of reduce the problem of showing that a transaction balances with this unknown signer to a particular kind of ring signature construction. You can bundle together with kind of the old way we used to do ring signatures, which was just signing kind of on behalf of a list of particular uh, uh, possible previous outputs. Yeah, so I, I guess it I guess it kind of screws with your mind a little bit. It's one of those things where like you look at it for a long time and then at some point like something snaps in your head, you're like, My God, 
I suddenly get how we can balance amounts and also obscure the signer of a transaction. And then like oh. you're forever changed. It's, it, so, so the fact the, the reason they're tied together is because you don't want to compromise which ring member is the real input. So, so the, the best way to do that is to stick the proof that the mounts balance in this, in the ring signature with the proof that you own it. Um, that way the, yeah, the, the, so you, you don't want the fact that you're proving the mounts balance to, to actually give away the fact that one specific output is the real one. So you end up actually making a bunch of fake proofs that all the other amounts in the ring balance. And then since the, 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 the proof that the output is owned and the proof that the amounts balance are tied together, then the, the one real one in the ring uh, with all the other fake proofs, the fact that they're tied together means that the one you're spending is the real one, is, the, is really equal to the amount being spent, I guess. So they have to be tied together to, with, to, to prevent re revealing uh, the real input. Yeah. More details, if you want, can be found in Zero to Monero. <laughs> <laughs> so confidential transactions was originally developed with Bitcoin in mind, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then obviously it's been implemented in Monero. So was it a lot, a lot more complicated conceivably to, to implement it into Monero given that we have ring signatures than to implement mm -hmm. it in Bitcoin? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean like the, the, the idea of, of using um, commitments to balance amounts and signing on behalf of those amounts in some way like it's like it's it's a fairly like straightforward mathematical process, um, but like Co was saying, like making that play nicely with this like signer ambiguity in these ring signatures, like that's not necessarily very obvious. Um, and the fact that that was able to be done, I think, was really cool. I've I've always thought that that's that was like a fantastic idea. Like makes me smile when I think about it. <laughs> uh, that it can play so nicely, um, and not only that, but like it's a very general operation. So I was talking before about how you can kind of like rip out certain kinds of signatures and kind of throw new signatures in there. Kind of like the original ML SAG rig signatures to these new CL SAG signatures um, and things like Triptych. And it turns out that like the same idea of being able to like sign for the outputs, but also for the amounts in some way, like that holds in ML SAG. It also holds in a very similar way in CL SAG and a very similar way in Triptych, even though they all work a little bit differently. So it's like this really nice, this really nice general approach to kind of signing on behalf of um, kind of signer ambiguous outputs with unknown amounts that you can kind of like translate from one construction to another. It's, it's really cool. So like you can do ring confidential transactions with like a lot of different underlying plumbing and you can get different efficiencies from different ways to do that. So were the guys that developed confidential transactions the same guys that developed ring confidential? No, right? It was, it was um, the original. Um, the original confidential transactions paper was by Maxwell, and I don't remember if there were any co-authors. I don't think there were. Um, but the ring confidential transaction paper um, was by Shen Noether, and I don't believe there were any co-authors on that paper either. I don't think so. Maybe some ed editing work done by other people. Yeah, I mean, like no, no one is an island, but. Um, but Shen Noether kind of worked on that idea. Um, and then later that was kind of applied to, it uh, originally was applied to ML SAG signatures, which are the ones we use now. It also applies to CL SAG signatures. It also applies to Triptych and a few other approaches. Oh, yeah. Very cool. So, I mean, I, I could, we could go through this all day, go through the uh, zero to Monero. I think. <laughs> you want to go through page by page, Co? Oh man, sure. 10 hours later bring up in particular about uh, you know this latest edition or well uh, I guess additionally to that the extra content that was added there's some probably the, the one big one for me was um, about multi multi signatures so I added a chapter about Monero multisig so originally with the first edition I didn't add a multisig chapter because um, Brandon's paper about multi-signatures was not done yet, so I didn't actually publish my multi-sig chapter. But then I added it to this one and updated it. And then along the way, we 
um, added some improvements that so it's not it's not like a, a completely faithful chapter because there are several points where Monero itself needs to be updated for multisig to be more secure. Mm -hmm. um, and then then beyond beyond that, I applied multisig to how you can use it like as efficiently as possible in a marketplace. Since currently, as far as I know, no multisig is being used for any like commercial use that I know of. It's pretty, the amount of use of multisig is pretty low as far as I know. But one, one really big way to use multisig is in a marketplace. So two of three multisig, the escrow, escrowed purchases is a, it's a really important step forward for any, crypt, any serious crypto is to implement these escrowed exchanges. Um, so I, I talked about how you can do that in the most efficient way possible that I could think of. And because Monero multisig is a lot more complicated than, say, Bitcoin, which I don't actually understand at all because I haven't looked into it. But I heard it's quite quite a bit simpler. Do yep. you have any comments? Multisig um, again. Yeah, so I mean, there's multisig like as a general, I guess like a general problem that can be reduced down to mathematical constructions is like very, very non-trivial. Like it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's easy to come up with different ways that you might attempt to do it. Um, but it's also not necessarily very easy to find out ways that that could go wrong that exist. So at the Monero Conferenza, for example, um, Andrew Polstra um, talked a little bit about how to do how like Schnorr signatures, um, which is sort of kind of how Monero ends up, do, ends up doing its signatures. Um, how different approaches to toward multi-sig um, that seem reasonable can go wrong um, and why that makes it a really, really tricky problem to get right. Um, and, you know, mathematically proving that a particular construction is secure is very non-trivial. Um, and um, the paper that Brandon and I wrote about how to do multi-signature that plays nicely with our ring signatures, it's like a fairly lengthy paper. <laughs> and it's one whose math has not been fully implemented in Monero, which is what Co was talking about. So, you know, it's like, it's, what's unfortunate is that you'd really like multi-signature to kind of be a one and done operation where like I do something, the other signers do something, and then we're just done and everything is great. Um, but you can't really do that. There's all these ideas of like transferring information back and forth in different rounds. And we'd like to minimize the number of rounds and the amount of communication possible. Um, but you can only go so far with doing that before you start sacrificing formal security. So there's always kind of this, this back and forth between, you know, to what extent can we prove a particular multi-state construction is secure? And to what extent is it like efficient enough to be reasonable that folks would actually want to use it? Yeah, so I, I had to add some, some optimization. I, I had to optimize a little bit to really, to fit Monero multi sig into like a, the kind of the kind of pro or purchase workflow you're 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 used to when you go online and buy something, because um, if you go with like the the normal multi sig path, then it's you end up with extra steps at the end where you're like sending emails back and forth that are you really don't want to be sending. <laughs> like, please confirm this. Please send me your your signed signet your signed transaction. That's that's too annoying. <laughs> yeah, like it's like the the the, uh, the statement like Monero is more complicated than Bitcoin is like a very true and honest statement, and like the mathematics is different, and I would say like it is more complex, and like that has real world consequences that we're always trying to make better, but like there's mathematics is not without its limits. So. Right, right. Do we know of anywhere where multi sig Monero is being implemented in the in the real world or? We have the Monero multisig system, which is which allows you to do multisig through the command line interface, the CLI. Um, whether people are using that, we don't know because Monero is private. Yeah, what's like ideally what you want out of multisig is for it to appear just like any other transaction. So ideally, we should have no idea. Right. If we're doing it correctly. But do we know of any like marketplaces that are trying to use it yet? Or? We, I've heard of people who want to use it, but none who have to use it. Because yeah, it, it needs it needs a big. It's kind of a big development project to get 
to get it from where we are now to where it would be pretty useful in that in that context. I think it's all worth noting about multisig that kind of one of the kind of the theoretical hangups about um, implementing some of these next generation construction uh, transaction constructions um, is that multisig would have to work differently um, in basically all of them. And like that's kind of a little bit of an engineering hiccup that we haven't really fully worked out yet. So, you know, when folks ask, like, why don't you just implement these next generation things right now? Like multisig is one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. It would not work the same way. It's possible to do, but it's it's not trivial to make it work the way we want it to. Yep. All right. So when when can we expect expect uh, version three? Oh, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't expect it very soon. <laughs> I probably wouldn't I probably wouldn't want to release it until after the next or around the time the next generation of transaction protocols goes out, which would be like something like Triptych or something else maybe, which would, is just probably quite a ways down the line, maybe on the order of years, yeah. So don't expect it too soon. This is great. Really appreciate you guys taking the time. Co, it was nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, where can people learn more about you? And zero, I mean, zero to Monero, they could just Google, they could find it, they could download. That's, yeah, read that, that's what I say. <laughs> I, I'm I'm in the MRL uh, IRC channel if you have questions or my email on the paper line too. That's about it for me. Okay. So Rang, same, you might as well give, give the spiel on where people can learn more about you and find more information. Um, I mean, yeah, like I, I hang out on the Monero dash research dash lab um, IRC channel on Freenode. Um, that's what Co was talking about. Um, that's where a lot of research discussion happens and just kind of regular meetings where anyone's welcome to drop by and talk about things that they think are interesting. Um, and yeah, I think, I think my email is probably also on zero to Monero as a contributor. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, but kudos to Ko who like was, yeah, he spearheaded and basically ran this entire thing. And I think it's great to have something that is as comprehensive as zero to Monero is. I'd say it's the closest thing we have to a protocol specification. Um, and anytime anyone's like, how does this thing work? I'm just like, ah, go read it there. Right. It's a fantastic thing to be able to say now. <laughs> Definitely. Cool. I'm, super glad, I'm super glad we have it now. It's a fantastic resource. Were you funded at all to do this, or was it just uh, the, the first? The, the first edition was unfunded, and the second edition, there was a C, uh, FFS way back in the day, and then it took me a little while to get it actually done. <laughs> So it was like uh, 45 XMR, I think, for the FFS. Yeah, definitely, definitely well deserved, obviously. Thank you. Is there a place where people can donate? Can donate more, or is there? Uh, no, no, I don't think donating. No, it's okay. <laughs> I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks again. Really appreciate it, and uh, hope to have both of you on again in the future. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. Hello. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.